you know, people made fun of me. Um, I, I can remember many, many times hearing from our sales team that, you know, others out there were saying that no one would ever pay what we needed to charge. And I said, you know what, you pay for what you get. And if you're looking for service and you're looking for support and you're looking for product that's always getting better, you know what, the market will pay for it because this is their number one revenue line item. They're not trying to save money here. They're trying to make money. Welcome to the Attraction Pros Podcast, where professionals in the attractions business can get tips, tools, and even a bit of inspiration. Join us as we tackle some of the most important topics facing the attractions industry today and gain insights from some of the top leaders, creators, and influencers from the exciting world of theme parks, zoos, museums, aquariums, and family entertainment centers. Because this show is created by Attraction Pros for Attraction Pros. I am Josh Liebman, Director of Business Development for Amusement Advantage. I help attractions understand and improve their guest experience. And I'm Matt Heller, Founder of Performance Optimist Consulting. I help leaders lead and work with attractions to increase employee engagement and retention. Now sit upright, hold on tight, and enjoy the leading resource for attractions industry professionals, the Attraction Pros Podcast. Hey, Matt, how's it going? It's fantastic, Josh. How are you? I'm so glad to hear that. <laughs> Matt, I have a question for you. Shoot, go for it. What is the longest you have waited in line for a ride attraction experience at some sort of tourism destination, recreation, or leisure slash amusement establishment? Mm, that is a great question. I want to say the longest I've waited was at one of two attractions that you've worked at. Okay. We might have the same answer then. <laughs> <laughs> so it was either Millennium Force or Top okay. Thrill Dragster. Okay. Um, and I can't remember which was longer, somewhere in the two and a half, maybe to three hour range for either one of those before I got smart and started doing the, uh, the, the fast fast lane, fast cut, you know, when, whenever they started those kind of things. So I think it was one of those two things that I, I waited longest in. It was on the same day. Are we talking like between <laughs> five to six hours of your day was just Millennium and Dragster? I don't think so. I think, I think Dragster was closer to when it actually opened. Okay. Um, and at that point, Millennium's wait was a little shorter, but, and, and Millennium would, <laughs> would have been, you know, probably closer to that one opening as well. But um, yeah, it's, it's got to be one of those two, I think. Uh, same for me, definitely with Dragster. I think I've waited north of three hours to ride it, and I believe it was it was the season that it opened, uh, which is funny because I, I rode it several times that season, and even I think on like my I don't know eighth or ninth time riding it, I happened to wait three hours in line. Now there were also some downtimes, you know, mm -hmm. with that too. I think that happened. What's really frustrating is when you get to the station and you've waited so long already, and then maybe you're already like harnessed in, and then the ride goes down. And you're like, well, I've already invested this much time, so right. I'm going to do it even further. And that ties in really nicely with the guest that we have today, uh, Steve Brown, the CEO of Excesso Technology Group, uh, which is a very large tech company within our industry. Uh, for our audience, you've probably heard of them. You may have uh, worked with their product in some capacity. Uh, they do ticketing, they do virtual queuing, uh, they have a number of other products within their portfolio, including Siriusware, including Showware, TE2. Uh, they're definitely one of the largest technology companies within our industry. Absolutely. And, you know, to hear um, Steve talk about virtual queuing and the other products that they have to offer, you know, there really is a place, not that we didn't know this already, but there is a place for technology in our, in our parks. Where we use that technology, I think, is key. And then how that really ties into the guest experience is also really key and something that we have to consider. Right. And, you know, when thinking about virtual queuing and how Steve uh, talks about that the number one objective that people will use to not visit a theme park is because they're waiting in line. That that is, a, that is more of a concern than the actual price of admission, which we know is a, a concern throughout the entire industry. Uh, I was thinking back to when we were chatting with Dennis Mosley-Williams and talking mm -hmm. about the experience economy. And Dennis said something that really sums up a lot of what our industry deals with that we're gonna be tackling on today's podcast 
which is, you know, he said, don't focus on increasing satisfaction rather than focus on decreasing sacrifice. Yeah. And when you think about waiting in line, that's a sacrifice that our guests are making. Uh, so after we did talk to Dennis and the experience economy, I, I picked up the book and, you know, started reading it. And, and I got to that point where the authors talk about uh, sacrifice because Dennis didn't write the book. We had to make that clear on the podcast. <laughs> I, well, he'll it, sign one for you. Right, exactly. I can't wait to get it signed by him. Yeah. And, and, and the authors talk about, you know, they use an example of someone that flies frequently on a consistent airline. And whenever the beverage cart comes around, uh, he asks for Pepsi. And they say, well, we only have Coke. Is that okay? Or the other way around. Uh, and he accepts it, but he makes the sacrifice and asks it, you know, each time he flies, that eventually he just asks for Coke, even though he really wants Pepsi. He's accepted the sacrifice and the business might look at that, the airline might look at that and say, perfect, our customers are satisfied because they're not necessarily, you know, complaining about something in particular. Mm -hmm. But it's not that they're satisfied, they've just accepted the sacrifice and that there's an opportunity to smooth out that sacrifice and that friction point. And the biggest sacrifice that we have in our industry is waiting, waiting in line, always has been. So this will be a really interesting conversation, particularly when we talk about virtual queuing of how the industry is really improving on this aspect, on the sacrifice that our guests are making, and how how COVID really uh, kind of put that in the in the forefront because it you know it incorporates social and physical distancing as well. You know, when you think about somebody spending an entire day at a theme park or an amusement park, and how much time is actually spent in line, and how much how that time could be used in different ways, you know, to really enhance the guest experience, even if they get on the same number of attractions, but they're not in the, the corral queues going back and forth and back and forth and seeing the same people going back and forth. Um, you know, it could really impact the guest experience and how they view their day overall and whether or not they have this, this sort of pent up frustration of waiting in line and the stress that that adds. And, you know, if you're in a, in a park with little kids and then you've got to stand in line, you know, that makes that, that journey uh, more boring because you just, you're just standing in line uh, for so much of your day. So, you know, the virtual queuing and ways to alleviate that stress or alleviate that, uh, that sacrifice, I think is a really, really important thing for us to be thinking about whether it's, you know, post COVID or any time when we're thinking about our guest experience. And I think so often, you know, we get into our operation and we think, well, this is an accepted sacrifice that is just accepted. So we might as well just go with it and think about something else. Right. Well, I think COVID and, and specifically physical distancing has sort of forced us to rethink about that. And so I'm really interested also to talk to Steve about, um, you know, what, what truly is a virtual queue? It's not just a reservation system um, and how those things are really different and how dynamic and elastic, I think was the word that he used, uh, a virtual queuing system really is. I feel like you and I could have an entire episode that's just our commentary on our interview with Steve, but <laughs> for the purpose of serving our audience, I'd say let's give them what they want and let's get to this interview with Steve Brown. <laughs> Steve Brown, CEO of Excesso Technology Group. We are so excited to have you here on the Attraction Pros podcast. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We're really looking forward. I feel like we have a lot of ground to cover. So let's, I would say let's waste no time here. But can you give us a, just a, a quick rundown of your career path throughout the attractions industry? Certainly. Uh, I started my theme park career in uh, around 1989 when the Disney MGM Studios, as it was known then, was opening. Uh, so I, I began my career actually as a merchandise host at Walt Disney World and I uh, was in that for a couple of years. Uh, I was in college at the time. Uh, I kind of moved around colleges in, in Florida, University of Florida, USF, UCF. And uh, so I, was, uh, I worked in merchandise and I eventually ended up there in industrial engineering, then and went back to business school. Uh, came back to Disney unexpectedly, uh, was kind of planning to move on to something else, then spent the next decade or so, uh, a little bit more than that actually, in, in finance at Disney, was in uh, the finance and revenue management area, eventually ended up at Disneyland in California, which is an amazing place, and was the VP of revenue management, so ticket pricing, hotel revenue management. Um, I was sort of a, a ticket guy at Disney for, for quite a while. Then I, I took a jump, uh, you know, thinking that life is more than, than one chapter. I jumped, uh, jumped ship, so to speak, and joined Six Flags. I moved to New York City, 
was there for a couple of years as doing similar work, uh, ticketing, revenue management, pricing, group sales. I had actually never been to New York City in my life. I went for the interview and got hired in the interview, and uh, so that was quite a that was quite a turn in 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 uh, in terms of geography and new experience. I was there for a couple of years, then I ended up um, going to work for the company that did the Six Flags e-commerce that I had brought in, and uh, that company was struggling uh, to say the least. I came in there in 2007 and uh, ended up kind of reorganizing the company. A few years later, ended up buying it. I'm making a long story short here. And, uh, you know, as that progressed, and we'll talk more about the technology and, and, and do, that, do that later, but as that progressed, I uh, ended up selling the company to a, a large British company that was called LoQ. And uh, that was in 2012. And so it's kind of been a process of Disney to Six Flags to theme park technology, and now even more theme park technology as over the years at Accessa, we've done a number of acquisitions and, uh, you know, now serve over a thousand venues around the world in all kinds of different leisure operators, ski resorts and cruise lines and not just theme parks. So it's a pretty broad based technology company, but it all goes back to my, my roots for me, at least uh, starting, you know, some, I guess, 30 years ago almost. Yeah, Steve, I'd love to tap into that just for a second, because you hear about so many people that start on the front lines and kind of make their way into the industry and, and make a career for themselves. So I'm curious, what are some of those lessons that you learned as a merchandise associate at, uh, at Disney that have really stuck with you and, and helped you through your career today? Well, guest service is number one. And, uh, you know, I learned, I learned, I cut my teeth on some pretty tough guest service people. You know, when a new theme park opens, they tend to put their top managers in those parks. So I, I came into the, into the Disney genre with some fairly sharp, uh, some sharp managers that were tough and also were great leaders as well. And I learned a lot about guest service and I learned a lot about um, volume. I had never seen volume like that in my life. Um, you know, I expected going to work in merchandise. I would sort of be feather dusting the shelves and, and putting some things out once in a while. But you know, it was so crazy when that park opened and just seeing that I was, I was kind of enamored with it, but you know, the, um, you would walk out of the stock room with an armful of t-shirts with the, the, the theme park logo on them and people would literally take them out of your hands before you could get to the rack. So you'd walk out, you'd have empty, you'd be empty handed before you got to the rack because there was, there were just so many people there. And we actually had gone to almost operating 24 hours. So the, the opening shift would be coming in when the closing shift was leaving because they were just so busy. And I, I think all of that just sort of, you know, gotten my attention as being really cool. I grew up at half an hour away from Walt Disney World, so I knew the parks very well and would go several times a year as a kid, but I'd never seen the business side of it. And it was really enlightening to me to see really what goes on behind the scenes and how you scale. How do you, how do you scale customer service? It's easy when you're dealing with a couple of customers at one time, but when you have thousands and tens of thousands, you know, how do you manage that and how do you do it efficiently? And, uh, you know, where, so that was the, the beginning of Disney, but really where I, I learned the business side was um, the lessons learned, you know, you have to network. And uh, I'll tell you a quick story on this. I, I, was a, I ended up being a merchandise lead at the front area of the theme park. And, and I would walk out there, like we had a shop outside the gate, and I would always see these people working with their clipboards and talking to customers and, or to guests. And eventually I got to know these folks. And I'm like, hey, what are you guys doing? They're like, oh, we work in industrial engineering. We're doing exit surveys. And over time, I started working overtime with those folks. And that turned into a job in industrial engineering. That, that really opened my eyes into the business side of Disney. And you know, to this day, the people I work for are still good friends. And in fact, I talked to, um, to Erin Wallace just two days ago. She used to be the director of industrial engineering. She went on to become the SVP of operations, the COO of Great Wolf. And uh, you know, you build these lasting connections early in your career, and you have to you maintain them. And to me, that's you know, that's one of the most important things I learned was just you know how important leadership was, how important it is to to you know do a great job no matter what your job is, whether you're stocking shelves in merchandise or taking surveys at the front park, you know, in front of the park, your reputation lives with you forever. And uh, I think that that's something that I, I tell people now is you know it doesn't matter if you're not doing the most exciting job make it exciting and, and make the most of it because that is, that is building your brand, whether you're 20 years old or, or, you know, just out of college or in college, you're building your brand and, and you will have, you will have those connections for the rest, for the rest of your life. And uh, so to me, that's, that's uh, you know, really how I got my start there. And I remember, you know, back in the day we had phone books. 
it's not phone books. So Walt Disney World had a phone book or a Disney company had a phone book. And I remember going through that phone book and, and thinking, well, who's in industrial engineering? Who's in marketing? Who should I, who can I talk to about getting an internship or, you know, I would just, I would go through that phone book and think, you know, what, where are these, what are the departments they even have in this business? Where might I want to work? And uh, just having that cur curiosity and uh, perseverance, I think is, is really the difference because, um, you know, I was one of tens of thousands of employees there trying to find your way through. Um, and so you really have to be, you really have to have a lot of, uh, a lot of commitment and focus um, and just at the end of the day, do a great job, no matter what you're doing, um, you know, merchandise or I used to work overtime selling glow jewelry and, you know, I would always want to be the number one glow jewelry seller for the night. Um, no matter what you do, you, you know, you have to put your best foot forward and, and I think that sticks with you and you have to build those principles early in your career. And, and Disney certainly taught me a lot about that. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for that. So then, you know, as you progressed, you know, from merchandise into finance and then even, you know, moving over to Six Flags and you were, you know, leading to, I guess, the, you know, the founding of Accessor, or you then, you know, going in and, and acquiring, you know, this technology company, what was the, the gap? You had obviously now seen a lot of uh, you know, a, a lot of what the business looked like from the finance and the revenue side of it, you know, from Disney and from Six Flags and looking at it, you know, on this very kind of high level view. And, and what was it that that needed to be filled that didn't exist from the technology standpoint at that time? Well, first of all, I'm very entrepreneurial. So I think my whole career, I've, I've been looking for, you know, I was looking for opportunities to to do something, you know, on my own terms, perhaps. And, and, something that was a little bit outside the box. And what I learned over my time at Disney and finance and then at Six Flags was there was a gap on the vendor side on, on the theme park industry is where, where I was looking at it from. In terms of the vendors, the technology vendors, understanding what you actually need on the operator side. So, you know, system functionality, revenue management functionality. And what, what I learned is that our, our ticketing vendors at Disney, which, you know, they're, they're still out there today and they're, they're good vendors, but we, we didn't fully always understand how to use the system. Um, we had to have teams of people to operate the system to get the full advantage of it. And what I saw as I, as I stepped out of Disney was other companies would have these great systems and not even realize the features they could use. At Disney, we had, we had patched that with a service model. We had a team. We could afford to have a team to, to learn how to use the system and to know every page of the, the sort of user manual and to work with the vendor. And, and we, could, we had those resources. But what I realized was that the broader industry would kind of buy the solution, whatever it was, and they would have some training in the beginning. And then a year or two later, they would say, oh, this system isn't very good. You know, it doesn't do A, B, C, D. We're like, well, actually, it actually does. You just don't know how to use it because they didn't have the service model we had at Disney to apply that out. And so my thought process was if we could take that, pro that, that service model and apply it to the software that was being sold to the industry where customers really got great support and uh, we're working with a vendor that listened to what they needed and could respond quickly with changes that, you know, we had, a, we, there could be a model for success out there. It wasn't just sell the software, give them a user manual, charge them some thousands of dollars for training, right? Which is, which is uh, what most vendors do. They charge for training and wish for the best and then collect your maintenance revenue for the rest of your, rest of your, of your life. To me, that wasn't what venues wanted or what they needed. They needed more help. This is their number one source of revenue, ticket revenue, or maybe it's their food and beverage or other areas that a system is providing. They need to know how to use the features and they need to use them. And if they, they need a service model on the tech side that helps them make all that happen. And too many software companies are just trying to make the sale and then sort of push that over the wall to the customer and, okay, let's go on to the next sale. Well, that's great for the software company in the moment, but it's not great for the customer that bought it because they're, they're never going to be, they're never going to have a deep relationship with that product. They're going to love it for the first few months. They'll be frustrated here and there. And then over time, their, their, love, their love affair with the software will decline. And it really should be increasing every year versus declining. And I thought that was a service model that we could apply from my Disney experience because that's what we did. We said, look, we have all these systems there. Operations doesn't understand it fully. Finance doesn't fully understand it. Marketing doesn't know our capabilities to create promotions that match up with the system. So if we can provide a service model that helps all those areas in the company, 
utilize our capabilities more, right? Or funnel the requirements that we need back to the vendor, then we'll have a better, we'll have a better product and we'll actually make more money at the end of the day, which is really, really the important part. You know, make more money or have a better guest experience. And, you know, that was what I saw as the opening in the tech industry for the leisure sector was how can you provide more of a full service model with software? And, you know, people made fun of me. Um, I, I can remember many, many times hearing from our sales team that, you know, others out there were saying that no one would ever pay what we needed to charge. And I said, you know what, you pay for what you get. And if you're looking for service and you're looking for support and you're looking for product that's always getting better, you know what, the market will pay for it because this is their number one revenue line item. They're not trying to save money here, they're trying to make money. And so, um, you know, we sort of defied that logic and, uh, you know, continued to invest in building great systems and listening to our customers and, and providing service and support. So that was really the opening I saw was that, that sort of vendor client gap that existed. Um, and I thought, how, can, how could we close that as a software provider? Um, you know, and, and then over time, what we've done is we've acquired more products and more systems besides just the, the core ticketing system that I started with. And we apply that model across the board. It's the philosophy of how we operate. So Steve, can you talk a little bit about those acquisitions and how you kind of brought them under your, under your umbrella and got them to kind of buy into your, your system? Sure. Well, you know, we, we realized that the attractions industry didn't have a provider of, we would say a provider of scale, right? There wasn't an IBM for the attractions industry in terms of the solutions they need, whether it's queuing or point of sale or ticketing, um, even, uh, you know, some of the guest experience and guest management products. So the, uh, you know, the, the, the mission that I set out on when I, when I sold my company to LowQ was, let's create a provider, a brand that has scale and has trustability, if that's a word, with, with the marketplace because there's scale. You haven't got to worry about the vendor going away next year. Um, let's, let's create something that has a reputation in the industry for service and quality product. And, you know, let's make a statement to the industry and let's provide operators with a really great product set um, instead of the operator needing to go to four or five vendors you know, perhaps we could provide that and, and then have a deeper relationship with the customer. And in the end, they can have a better, a better product. So yeah, we, we you know, we purchased uh, several, several companies. We started with, with my company, which is, which is now Accesso, oddly enough. Um, I always say the company took the, the took the married name because LoQ wasn't a great name for the business. Accesso was a better name. And uh, so we, we used that name after the acquisition, but then we went on, we, we bought Seriousware, which is, you know, just a great product and, uh, sort of cultural and ski sector um, for food and beverage and merchandise and, and ticketing. We bought Showware, which expanded our, our um, reach into the assigned seating and theatrical live event space, which was not something we had. We acquired Showware, which gave us great distribution capabilities and expanded our reach into other outlets besides the customers on website. Um, we acquired TE2, which is an identity management platform, which is a, a bit complicated to explain, but essentially it's the, it, it's a syndicated platform that, you know, users can subscribe to, like they subscribe to say salesforce.com or something, but it's where you can have a, a customer relationship with your millions of theme park visitors. So we, we, we create an identity for each customer and then keep track of all their behaviors and activities. So you can target them better and have a more, a more, um, I guess a, a deeper relationship or more contact with them when they're in the physical environment through an app or whatever other means you have to communicate with them. So, you know, we've, we've put together a, a really, you know, a great set of assets alongside LoQ and alongside the passport solution. And, uh, you know, we can pretty much cover whatever you need if you own a theme park or museum or ski resort or, you know, any number of visitor attractions like that. So um, we are kind of a one-stop shop now. What kind of challenges have there been, you know, when, when looking at all these acquisitions, you know, they, they all have their individual character and their personality. And, uh, you know, recently I, I took a Bob Iger's masterclass through the, you know, the masterclass program. I mean, he did, a, he did a whole unit on, you know, talking about, you know, acquiring Pixar and, you know, ABC and ESPN and, and talking about and the importance of kind of the assimilation into the company yeah. culture. And I'm curious for any challenges that that you may have experienced, or or, or what you know, Excesso had to do to make sure that those companies were still able to kind of you know breathe and kind of you know march to the beat of their 
um, while also aligning very much with all the other brands in the portfolio. Yeah, and, and in all cases, we bought healthy businesses that were making money. So we didn't have an objective to go in there and, and, and you know, sort of fix them. That wasn't the objective. The idea was to, to create, you know, a more synergistic business that had, had multiple different, um, you know, types of products. So we weren't going in to clean them up. Um, so our, our approach was different than sometimes in acquisitions in particular, you'll see they're buying companies that are struggling or, you know, let's turn it around. You know, let's, we really weren't buying turnarounds. We were buying great businesses that had great histories with their customers and their employees. So we had to be very careful. And I think the, the most important thing, and, you know, did we always get it right? No. Um, but we certainly tried and you have to be respectful of the individual cultures that each company has. And you have to work yourself towards a center point that works for everyone. Um, yeah, you know, there are always mechanical things you have to look at that are, that are never fun, like vacation policies that are different or, you know, who gets a cell phone and who doesn't and all these kind of things that as a company, you know, when you're working together, you kind of need to have the same rules on that stuff or it, it becomes unfair. So you've got to work your way through those things, which, you know, it's, it is, th those aren't the hardest part. It's more, it's more the cultural piece and, and how, um, you know, every, every business sort of has a, its own, it's called tribalism in some cases, right? How do you avoid tribalism so that you work as one company versus a bunch of separate groups? And, you know, that's, that's the harder part. And you have to just take your time and, you know, allow people to absorb um, each other's cultures and get to know each other. And, uh, you know, even within the business units, it's not just that, it's also ge geographical. You know, how you do business in the UK is very different than how you do business in, in the US. And whether we're two companies, two products, or one, you're operating in different. You're operating in different in different ways, and you have to learn those those differences and respect them. And it just it takes time, and you can't rush it. You can't rush these integrations. You can't sort of have one. Let's have a big. Let's have a big all hands meeting, and we're going to solve all this. You know that does not work. It just takes time and and working your way through it. And each company has to give and take a little bit because each each business has great things. And maybe they can grab something that's great from another area and, and, and change what they're doing. And so you hope you end up with the best of the best on all the cultural differences, whether, you know, one division has a, an annual meeting or one company has fun Fridays or, you know, one company does, uh, you know, uh, something special for people's birthdays. You have to work your way through all those, all those different pieces because that's at the end of the day really what people are looking at when they're judging how you're handling the acquisition is how do you treat individuals? And, you know, there are parts that aren't always easy. Like I said, the, the, the plumbing part, you know, vacation and insurance. So people have the same health plans, those kinds of things. That's difficult. Um, but you always try to, you try to find the best common denominator across the group and just work your way through it. And uh, it's, it's not easy. Um, and we did a lot of acquisitions very quickly. We were doing almost one a year. So by the time you finished, all the, the, the work to get on the same payroll system, for example, we had another acquisition coming in. So it was a constant state of change. And, you know, in hindsight, we probably could have done some of that better. And I, I think some of our employees might, might, uh, might agree with me on that. But overall, I, I would say the general view is we did, we've done a good job with that. Um, you know, unfortunately, the last few months have made things more difficult, clearly, for any business, whether we were uh, a group of acquisitions or not. You know, the last, the last few months have been extremely difficult for everyone in this sector. Um, we had, you know, five, we have 500 employees roughly and zero revenue, more or less, you know, it, it's a difficult situation to deal through. And, and that's where you, you hope you've, you've built a sense of trust over time. And, uh, you know, people know that you're doing the best you can for each of them. And, and it's the same thing as you're acquiring company as you, as you do now. It's really when you show your true colors is during acquisitions, during tough times. It's not when everything is going great. It's, it's when things get tough that you show your true colors. And, and I think we've approached the acquisitions that way over the years. And uh, I believe that, that by and large, most team, team members would agree with that. There's always going to be some exceptions. Um, you know, some people just don't like change. They don't like change, whatever it is. And uh, so, you know, there's always those, no matter how hard you try, you're not going to please. But those are few and far between. Um, and uh, if you're breaking someone's comfort zone as it relates to their job, you know, it's an emotional thing. And you have to be aware of that and, and realize that everyone kind of processes things differently. So. Um, definitely been a challenge, uh, but not, uh, but I think one that is actually uh, overall been well received. Steve, I'm curious when you talk about those, those acquisitions that came so quickly, uh, you know, one after the other, was that a strategic decision that you thought these are, these are areas that we definitely want to get into, or was it 
well, this one looks like a good fit. Let's go with that one. This one looks like, look, looks like a good fit. I'm just curious about that, that decision process to acquire that many places so, so quickly. Well, we knew we couldn't you know, take 20 years to do this. We, it yeah. would just take way too long. We needed to move with some, with some sense of speed and we built some momentum around that. Um, and the hard part is we were looking for businesses that were not for sale. And so, you know, it, it's imagine trying to buy a house that's not for sale. You go to their door and you sort of knock on it. They don't answer it. You leave a note. They don't call you back. You know, you're, you're working through a process where companies are healthy. They're making money and the owners don't want to sell. Just like I wasn't interested in selling my business. So, you know, you have to, you have to really look hard to find the ones that make sense. But we were always looking to expand our reach, not buy more of the same. So we wanted to, we realized we weren't in the ski industry. That was a great opportunity. We had, we really didn't have an assigned seating product to be in theater and live entertainment. So what are, what are, what companies should we look at? You know, you sort of make a list, you kind of work your way through them. Um, primarily looking at reputation above all, first and first and foremost, what's their reputation in the industry? Will they be additive to our reputation? Um, we don't want to be, you know, fixing things. That's not, that's not going to help us progress the business. So, you know, what are the right fit opportunities where we, we think we can be aligned in the longer term and, uh, you know, as, as a, a former, uh, a former chairman used to say, you kiss a lot of frogs along the way. And, you know, a lot of them, you, a lot of them, you have a couple of conversations and you say, Whoa, that's not going to work. Um, you know, and then you, you keep looking for the gems along the way. And I think we've, you know, we've, we've built a collection of, of really great businesses that fit together well. Um, and, uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a process and, you know, a lot of behind the scenes and, and you're sort of always shop in shopping mode looking for those opportunities. Um, but, you know, primarily looking for businesses that aren't for sale is a little harder. Yeah. Uh, so Steve, you uh, departed Excesso a few years ago and you came back very recently. And I wanna talk a little bit about the return because the timing was very interesting. It was just a, a mere few weeks and you know, correct me if I'm wrong or, uh, or um, correct me on that. Um, but just very shortly before you know, everything shut down due to COVID. And I know that you came back with this, you know, this vision for, you know, uh, what you wanted to accomplish, you know, moving forward. I'm curious, you know, how did, how was that impacted by COVID in a, in a nutshell? <laughs> yeah, in a nutshell, I mean, you know, I, it certainly wasn't, it certainly wasn't on the plan that I was laying out when I was returning. Um, and it, it's quite frustrating, as you might imagine, but we're all in the same boat here. It's not like something happened just to us, you know, it's happened to the whole world. And that's what leadership challenges are all about is, is, is handling the unknown, handling the unexpected. And, you know, coming in when things were already, I would say not in a great place, our stock price had dropped, I think, I don't know, 80% since I, I left. Um, and you know, that's a pretty big drop um, in the course of a couple of years. And I care about the company. I, I also own a lot of stock. Um, and, you know, I thought this is, this is an opportunity to, to step back in and, you know, perhaps, um, you know, just rethink, rethink the vision and rethink how we're set up and structured and had, had a great plan, still have a great plan. Um, certainly got tripped up by this starting in March. Um, but from a leadership perspective, you know, I, I feel it's interesting, you know, I almost feel even more determined than I was at the end of January, because now I'm saying, by golly, this is not going to hold us back. Um, we're going to put our absolute best foot forward. We have an amazing team, extremely committed, this industry is not going away. Uh, our partners need us more than they've ever needed us. And, you know, it's our opportunity to really, to really make a difference. And on the other side of this, come out stronger um, as a company. And it's certainly not been easy. You know, putting, putting your, your team on furlough is a horrendous thing to have to go through. Um, you know, deciding which ones you, which ones are going to keep the lights on and which ones are going to be furloughed. And it's, it's tough. I mean, it's, uh, it's hard and you know it's something that we have tried to manage as, as best we can to be fair to everyone and and balance it out across the team but it's certainly not a great situation and you expect you know wow what if your revenue drops five percent or ten percent because it rains a lot or something crazy happens but who expects your revenue to go down by 90 percent 85 percent no one plans for that the whole the whole world doesn't plan for that so we're we're left looking at things that you would never imagine doing and um you know overall i think that's just when you show you show your your leadership skills and you show the you show the determination of the team and the commitment to the business which has been extraordinary from our team just really amazing um, and they know we'll get through this I know we'll get through this 
And uh, it's, it's frustrating, but I actually think on the other side of this, the industry overall is going to be quite strong and, uh, you know, it, it will bounce back. Um, we just need to get over this hump. Yeah. Steve, I love what you say about, um, you know, that it's, that it's difficult to go through this because, and I don't love that you had to go through that, but, you know, because you are so centered on your people, that that's what makes your company so strong, right? And I think that's that a testament to your leadership. And I, I want to talk a little bit about that when it comes to, you know, leading through this time for the attractions industry, because like you said, there's so many things that you do that the attractions industry needs right now. Um, one of those things be being virtual queuing. You know, so many places, it was almost like a nice to have and an upcharge in a lot of other places. And now people are looking at that as almost a necessity because of physical distancing and wanting to keep people apart. So I'm curious sort of about your thought process and the approach to the industry now that more and more people are, are asking about that and, and looking into that and how your team has rallied to, to make sure that that can happen to anybody who, who has come to you. Yeah, we've certainly had a lot of demand. Uh, it's, you know, virtual queuing is something that is a long, a long lead process on the sales, the sales end, a lot of considerations to, to work through. But the amount of inquiries we have in the last few months is, is pretty substantial. In fact, I have a call every single day, a half hour call with the sales team to go through where we are with each of those leads and talk through them. We do it every single day. Um, we have for the last, I don't know, six weeks probably. And uh, so, you know, we're, it, it's not that there's hundreds, but there's, you know, there's a, a very solid number and they don't all need virtual queuing. So part of our process is, can we help them with time ticketing instead? Do they really need virtual queuing? Do you need to add that layer of process in or is time ticketing really going to be sufficient or holy moly, they need virtual queuing, you know, times 10 because they've got a huge problem. Let's, let's help them understand that. And, and it's, it's been a process of just helping them evaluate that, you know, where, where I see the industry, uh, you know, looking at this is, okay, do we put a solution in to get through the social distancing efforts that may end up being with us forever? And how do we think about that? And do we want to step into that is a question. Because if you have it and you say, look, there's no, this year there's a virtual queue for the, our brand new roller coaster. And then next year you say, sorry, it's a three hour wait for the brand new roller coaster. How are you going to explain that to your customers? So I think there, there's a fair amount of, of, of uh, that in the industry uh, across many customers that are just thinking through, are they ready to make this paradigm shift in terms of how they operate the park? Then you have sort of progressive operators like Holiday World, um, Wallaby Holland, uh, Village Roadshow in Australia just reopened um, yesterday. Uh, I was reading, reading notes from them uh, just this morning. And, you know, they're using virtual queuing and it's working amazingly well. And their guest satisfaction scores are great. You know, 85, 90% of the customers say they would much prefer having a virtual queue to having a, a physical queue and waiting in the line. And, you know, it just, takes, it just takes time for the industry to move. This is a complicated decision and involves a lot of different factors around space planning. Mm -hmm. When people aren't in the queues, right, they end up in other places in the park. So you've got to think about the capacity from that. Um, but, you know, I, I, I still think in, in, at the end of the day, um, if your number one reason to not go to a theme park, and every survey I've ever seen across my career, and I've seen a lot of them, the number one reason is I don't like waiting in line. Number two is how much it costs. Always in that order. And if you can address the number one objection that consumers have to doing something, why would you not address it? It has to be better for the business if you can find a way to address the number one objection to buying your product. And so that is, that is my view on this. And it's not that the whole entire park needs to be on virtual queuing because a lot of attractions have a 10 or 15 minute wait. It's a very reasonable wait. No one minds that. It's, it's sort of part of the experience. It's when you have the 60, 90 minute, two hour waits and people end up waiting, you know, in two of those attraction lines, they spend half their day waiting in line when they could have been enjoying the other attractions that had lower demand, right? They could have been shopping, they could have been eating. Um, they're not just gonna stand around and sort of crowd the sidewalks. I mean, that would be boring for two hours. They're gonna go and find something else to do. And the more things that a visitor is able to participate in, the higher their guest rating. If they ride nine rides versus eight rides, their guest experience rating is better. If, if they enjoy, you know, enjoy a longer time in the park and it's a good experience, their rating is better. And so, you know, I think they're more likely to then post a photo on Instagram, which is incredibly important these days, of them having a great time versus posting a picture of the 90-minute wait time sign. 
you know, and then, and then saying it was 90 minutes and, and the ride was three minutes long. You know, that to me is, is a fundamental barrier to growth across the industry. And, you know, I'm hoping that our technology can help um, operators rethink that and, and sort of shift the paradigm. Putting their top two or three rides on a virtual queue could fundamentally, in my view, change how guests review their experience. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's also options to sell premium queuing, right? If you, if you want to spend a little more, you can upgrade. And I believe that by having everyone participating in the system on their smartphone in order to, to ride those two or three rides, it brings more people into the system. They have it right on their phone and they can click to buy the next level up at a much easier process than, than, than maybe going into a retail store and, and buying a, a wristband or, you know, doing something like that. It's so much easier if you have this sort of point of sale system in your pocket you just click and pay with, with Apple Pay or your credit card to use for your ticket purchase already stored or whatever, it unlocks a new revenue potential or it, it increases the revenue potential the parks already have. And it also then makes, I, I think, a significant difference on that number one objection to going to a theme park, which is waiting in line. And so I look at this broader than, than just, you know, how do you facilitate social distancing? Mm -hmm. um, you know, but I do think that setting up, you know, mile long cattle queues of, of, of steel railings um, when technology could easily solve this for mere pennies per visitor. It, it seems it seems um, to me uh, just a bit, uh, you know, not as progressive as it could be. I'll say it that way. And, and so I see these, you know, I see some of the lines and some of the parks and other parts of the world that have been open for a while. And you sort of see these pictures of these, you know, 800 person long snaky queues. And you have to remember the queues are distanced, the parties are distanced six feet apart, and then the switchback, you have to skip every other row in the switchback. So these queues take up a lot of space. And you know, what is that experience for someone who's already hesitant to go and maybe hesitant to go into the park because of social distancing? And now they're, they're wrapped in these long queues. We can provide a so much better experience. And that's what we're seeing in Hollywood, Holiday World, Wallaby Holland. That's what we're seeing um, in, in Village Roadshow from their reopening already. And, uh, you know, I hope the industry takes note of that. And, um, you know, where, where there's a difference and to talk about virtual queuing for a, a moment longer is there are reservation systems out there that say, quote, we're virtual. There are time slots or they're sort of like open table for theme parks. Um, they're not virtual queues. A virtual queue is a dynamic process. It's, it's elastic. It looks at what's happening at the attraction in terms of throughput. It looks at the number of guests coming back, the guest flow rate coming back, and it adjusts everyone waiting in that queue. So if you were given a, a, a expected return time of 115 and the ride goes down for maintenance, we're going to reshuffle everyone waiting in the queue and give them a little bit later time. If you're in a time slot system or a reservation system that isn't real time, everyone's gonna keep showing up. I say it's like Lucy in the candy factory, right? All, all the people are coming back and there's nowhere to put them, because the system wasn't dynamic enough and responsive enough to reshuffle everyone in that queue. And what happens if that ride doesn't reopen for the day and you need to dump the queue of everyone waiting? Where do they all go? And our system is, has been around you know, for 20 years. We truly invented virtual queuing. We held the first patent for theme park virtual queuing. And we've been perfecting this for, for 20 years. And it, it, it's a real virtual queue. And um, I have to say, I do find it a bit annoying sometimes when when time slot systems are called a, called a virtual queue or virtual line, because I don't, I think they they undersell the potential of what a real virtual queue is for a theme park. No, I completely agree with that, and I think it it takes so much operational knowledge of the complexities of how a theme park works to make that distinction. Versus, you said, you know, open table for theme parks, where it's just, oh, we're just adding in these time slots, and doesn't take into effect that you know, when if there's lightning within five miles or ten miles, and that's going to shut down, or, or you know, or, or the mechanical you know issues, or anything that that operators are going through on a daily basis that is. Uh, to a point second nature and you know it, it requires having that that operational intelligence to embed it into the technology versus the technology wanting to weave its way into the operations and that's something yeah that, and every uh, and every day is a little different so you can't yeah. always predict all the variables so you need a dashboard that allows you to change the variables so one of the things we're seeing right now in the parks that are that are open is the party sizes are smaller 
well, that makes sense, right? You're not bringing grandma. You're not maybe bringing your neighbor's three kids with you. You're probably just packing up your household and going to the park, right? Because you want to get out. You've been locked up for three, four months in quarantine. You want to get out and have some fun, but you're probably not, you know, texting 50 people, let's meet at the park. And so the, the group sizes have changed. And so you need a system that's very, very, you know, maybe they're bigger on Saturday, but smaller on Tuesday. And, and the group size matters when you're, when you're, when you're scheduling your virtual queue, because that's your throughput. And so you have to have a system that you can really adjust and fine tune for that, because if not, you'll either be bringing too many people back or not enough people back. And so you have to have a system that really is um, a, a lot more sophisticated than people would realize or expect behind the scenes in terms of all those variables and how you can manage them. And importantly, how you manage, you know, the, the ones that impact lots of people like, like dumping a queue, right? In our system, you can say, oh, you were waiting for an hour. We're so sorry. The ride's down now for the rest of the day. How would you like us to invest the time you've already spent on a different ride? We allow you to move that over and give you credit for the, for the hour you've already invested versus saying, sorry, 101, not riding that ride. Yeah. Your, your queue is canceled. We have a great system for allowing the guests to, to invest that time somewhere else. Um, and those are all the kinds of you know, use cases you have to think about in, a, in a, a, a really sophisticated virtual queue system that can handle tens and tens of thousands of people at the same time. It's very different than you might need for a virtual queue at the driver's license bureau, right, or the tax collector. This is much more complex. You have multiple queues running with thousands of people at the same time. And you have all these external variables you can't control, like weather and, and ride performance um, and guest behavior. So you need something that's much more advanced. And you know, you, you, the type of learning we have in our system from all the different circumstances has given us a range of features that the operators have at their disposal from their smartphone to adjust something if things have changed from what is predicted. So that's really what, a, what true virtual queuing is. And uh, you know, when it's when it's up and running, it's a it's a pretty beautiful thing, honestly. And uh, you know, if you if you look at how these parks that are operating are experiencing their crowds and social distancing, it's really like a textbook case study. You know, there's not big long lines of metal rails and people piled up at the gate. You know, turning into social media rants about social distancing. These are very well, um, you know, uh, executed reopening plans. And I think virtual queuing has played an important part of that for these operators. Do you think, and you know, COVID related or even COVID aside, but do you think that there will be a day where the standby queue is a thing of the past or will it always serve its purpose? I think the standby queue can always serve a purpose because there, you know, single rider lines, for example, is always an opportunity. Even with a virtual queue situation, you can still have a single rider slot to fill and you want to make sure that every seat is full to get maximum throughput. So I can see a case where you could have a secondary queue even on an attraction that's running at virtual queue. Um, and you have other, you know, you have other use case scenarios where you might need to ha handle some, um, some percentage of the guest population on the side, perhaps, um, you know, perhaps physical, physical disabilities or other reasons that, you know, you need to have a separate queue, virtual queue doesn't work. So I think there will always be a secondary, um, you know, a need for some sort of secondary process but it's minor. It's really, it's really about optimization or handling special cases um, versus let's have two options, those in and those out. It could operate that way, but I can't imagine why anybody, why anyone would stand in the standby queue if they have a choice not to. Right. Yeah. Steve, a minute ago, you mentioned throughput, you know, and one of the things that has gotten, uh, significantly smaller right now is the throughput that we can put like on a roller coaster as we're as we're distancing between seats and you know cleaning between the uh, between cycles so based on what you're talking about with virtual queuing your system will take that into account but how does that also impact the guest experience knowing that you know the the line may seem shorter because there's less people there but the cycles are also longer well, the line physically won't be any shorter, actually, because of six feet apart every group, right? right. But, the, but if you've got 50% of your attendance coming in, but your ride throughput is now 30 to 40%, you actually could have a longer wait time than you had under normal conditions last summer. And what we're, we're generally seeing is that the ride throughputs are somewhere in the 40% range um, as they're skipping every other row or they're grouping. And there's also, with the smaller party sizes, say a, a boat or a roller coaster that seats four across, well, if it's only a party of three now, you're, you're losing a seat in that row. So it's not just the row in front of you they skipped, it's also the seat in your row that, they, that was underutilized because you can't put a stranger in that seat. 
So overall, you're, you're at 50% with just skipping the rows, more or less. And now you have a further loss of that. And then you add in the additional cleaning cycles, which, which then reduce the throughput. And we're seeing something more in the 40% range, some even down closer to 30. Um, so you have to then, you know, if your ride normally, your expected throughput in the system is say 1500 people an hour, you've got to take that down now to, you know, 600 people an hour, or 500 people an hour, um, and then schedule accordingly. Granted, there are fewer people in the park, but again, that's, that's a pretty, pretty significant impact on ride throughput. And then, you know, if you look at the the optics of the guest experience, that it, it can create additional frustrations if you're waiting in a line that looks like it should feel shorter because there are less people in it, and then seeing the ride, That's you know, right. watching trains coming by that are, you know, that are half full or that, you know, on that four across seat with the third one, you know, or the fourth seat empty. Uh, and then it's it's additional it's additional friction and frustration on the overall guest experience too. It's sort of like going into a restaurant and they say it'll be a thirty minute wait. And you look around and you see half the tables are empty. And you think, well, why am I waiting thirty minutes? Right. It's because the kitchen can't keep up with the number of people that they're seating, right? So mm -hmm. it's the same kind of thing where you see the ride going and you're you're thinking, why is this line two hours? The park isn't that busy, but it's that operational throughput. I mean, operators live on throughput. Everything is about. You know, if you're if you can put 1,500 people in a ride, you're measured on hitting 1,500 every hour when you look across the day. That's operator efficiency. And so now to sort of say let's throw that out the window and and socially distance everyone, all of a sudden that number drops significantly. Um, you know, against the reduced attendance capacity. I, I do want to say though that the attendance capacity I, I, there is some degree of not misnomer, but perhaps overinterpretation of that that theme park capacity limit because. I don't think that most parks operate above 50% on most days anyway. And so if you're operating at 50% of what your fire capacity or your measured capacity is, you might be a little bit closer to what is actually normal for you with some, uh, some exceptions, July 4th, New Year's Eve, maybe Saturdays, but in general, you know, a 50 or 75% reduction um, or attendance limit might actually end up almost giving you prior year numbers um, in terms of the, of the attendance because those parks are huge. And they have a lot of land and a lot of space. And it's really not up to me, it's not about that. It's about how do you avoid the bunching or the social distancing violations in all those hot spots in the park? Because you have enough room to spread them out theoretically on the map, but that's not where they want to be. They want to be at the main roller coasters, the top three or four places, the main restaurant. So how do you facilitate that number of people and still keep compliant with social distancing. And one of the things we realized quickly was it's not just about inside the park, it's also about the arrival experience. And you know what we see is parks that don't use time ticketing, they don't space out, you know, you, you book a, you book in advance and you pick 9, 915, 930, is everyone has been everyone's been uh, on quarantine, self-isolation. And if the park opens at nine o'clock, by golly, we're all getting there at nine o'clock. And they all sort of show up because they had a ticket for the day and a reservation. There's no spacing of the arrival patterns. And so then the, um, the entry to the park, before you've even begun the experience, has violated every rule in the social distancing handbook because you had these bottlenecks of security or at the front gate. And so what we've seen with using the times is, you know, it, it does help sort of balance people out. Even if you do it across the first two hours of the day, you're, you're spreading people so they don't all show up at exactly 9 a.m. or 8.30 a.m. or whatever the opening time is. So it really begins all the way through the process. It's not just inside the park with virtual queuing, but it's also that arrival experience and how you manage the guest flow coming in as well. Steve, I'm curious, can you talk a little bit about guest behavior and sort of the learning curve? Um, you know, we've all been through this. We've all seen on the, on TV, wear a mask and social distancing and all that kind of stuff, but it might get a little a little dicey when people are out, you know, for the first time they're out at the theme park and they just kind of forget about this stuff. So can you talk about what you've seen from a, from a guest perspective or a guest uh, behavior perspective and, and how well they're following the rules? What I've seen is a lot of people, um, I don't know, I would say maybe ranting on social media, but I'm not sure those are the people that are visiting the parks because what I understand from everything I've seen and heard and, and talking to lots of people is when people get to the park, they're actually very respectful of, of, of the rules and they signed up under what, what those guidelines were. They understood it very clearly. It was very clearly communicated and, and, and guests are behaving quite well actually um, inside, inside the venues and, and some portion of the visitors sort of hold the others, hold others accountable to some level. 
Um, but, but generally, you know, you're always going to have a few people who are, are going to, going to, you know, do their own thing or walk around with a drink all day so they can, they can say they have a drink. They don't need to wear a mask. You always have those kinds of situations, but that's really the minority from everything I've heard, um, uh, across the industry. Um, you know, it's interesting. Some, some areas like in, uh, you know, in Wallaby Holland, they aren't requiring face masks. It's a European, it's, the European uh, market is not as, as focused on the face masks as we are here in the U S. So it's, it's different by each region. But what I've seen across the U.S. is generally, yeah, a lot of a lot of rather heated comments on the social media post about it. But then in the actual practicality of the operation and not being a challenge, that's at least what I've heard. I haven't seen that with my own eyes, but that's what I've heard in the industry. Yeah. Uh, so, Steve, I, I want to switch gears a little bit because we're, we're starting to run a little low on time. But I want to hear a little bit about the. Uh, the additional business that you have and the glass knife, your, uh, your bakery in, uh, in Winter Park, Florida. And I kind of want to hear about uh, just what the, what the guest experience is like there and uh, all of the philosophies that we've been talking about that are integrated in with Accesso and with LowQ and with virtual queuing and just and the technology aspect of that. How much of that is, is kind of baked in, no pun intended, into, <laughs> into the glass knife? <laughs> that was good. I have not actually uh, heard that pun used in this situation before, but that was good. So it, it's all about the guest. Ex it's all about the guest experience and a story. You know, the restaurant is called the Glass Knife because my mom, who was an avid baker, um, collected Depression era glassware, and one of her prized collections were these beautiful glass knives that were made in the 20s and 30s, and uh, they were manufactured because. At that time period, metal knives weren't stainless steel, and they would leave a sort of metallic tin can taste on food. So someone created glass knives in the 20s and 30s, and they're, they're truly beautiful. And uh, that was the inspiration for the name. But the experience is, you know, begins in the story, and it goes all the way through the, 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 the building itself. The, the decor is all part of that story. The, the employees are part of the story. The food is part of the story. It's all about storytelling and, and, and providing a great guest experience. We're also fairly technology savvy. Uh, we don't have a lot of paper running around, as you might imagine, as a, as a tech person myself. Um, we, uh, you know, we're cashless, which was a bit before it was trendy in the in the light, in the light of coronavirus. But we were we've been cashless since we opened um, in, at the end of uh, 2017. And uh, you know, so uh, a lot of the things that I see in the the theme park world certainly apply. Um, I would say, if anything applies, my original Disney experience around guest service. And you know what you what the guest experiences when they come in every day is really at the forefront of how we operate. So, and by the way, in the spirit of, of social distancing, uh, I was there this morning for a coffee. I have my coffee with me here, and uh, you know everyone coming in is wearing a face mask. They're very respectful of that, and uh, you know I think it's my little laboratory of what the theme park world may be seeing. Um, you know, so many people. It's interesting to walk to the door and they see the sign and they go back to their car and they get their mask. So people are forgetful or they're, they're, looking, they're, they're looking for nods around what other people are doing, but they're willing to be compliant. So yeah, the glass knife is, 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 is uh, you know, sort of my pride and joy and it's something that I have a lot of passion around. And it's a great experience. If you get to, when, you, when you get to Winter Park, I hope that uh, we can see you there. And, and by the way, check us out on Instagram because it's a, it's a, it's a great, great feed to follow for some uh, sugar inspiration. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So Steve, why a bakery? Well, I'm a, I actually enjoy baking myself. So, you know, I, I like to cook, but, but more importantly, I like to bake. And my mom was a baker. And in the travel around the world that I've, I've done for work as well as personal, I've always been inspired by the, Euro, the European cafes. And I, I don't think in the U.S. we have the type of experience you would find at the Glass Knife, which is that very European feel, pastries, but you can also get lunch, you can get dinner. You can come in at 10 o'clock in the morning or 10 o'clock at night. It's that place that is uh, centered around the community or, or, or the center of the community. And it's something that people, you know, place that people look forward to meeting their friends or grabbing a special treat. And it's not a, it's not a high, you know, it's not the, um, it's just different. At, at the end of the day, you walk in and I hear so many people, if I'm sitting there, you know, quietly having a coffee or something, wow, this feels like I'm in Paris. or this feels like I'm in Europe. Or this reminds me of the place you went to one time in, you know, Sweden, or they always say, you hear comments like that all the time, because it's, it's a very European flair, and, and, um, and you know, it's, it's underpinned with American hospitality, um, and, and a, a bit of Americana, uh, when you walk in and you see the glass knives there and realize they were made in New York. Um, so it's a, it's a really cool mixture, and uh, it, it's a fun, it's a fun, it's a fun, uh, not a side project, because it's actually quite a bit of work, but it's a fun project. <laughs> 
Well, well, that was what I was going to ask, and, and I like how you said it's like your laboratory, and I feel like everyone just kind of like needs something like that just as an outlet to, you know, just kind of channel creativity into something. So how, how do you manage your time between doing that and running yeah. a huge tech company? Well, I have a great team. You know, I always, I always um, set the glass knife up to be scalable and to be self-sustaining. So we have a great team, of ma a great management team, great general manager, great operations director, an amazing executive chef. So they really run, they really run the place. I go in and have coffee and, you know, point out a few things, but uh, overall the business, the, you know, the business uh, is, it, it really runs itself and I get to work on the fun stuff, which is great. So do you, do you bake it all for, for the glass knife? Not for the restaurant. No, please. <laughs> I wish I, I, I let the chef handle that. He's uh he's much more qualified than I am. Thank you. Gotcha. And uh, I, I, I bake for my own purposes at home. Um, and, you know, sometimes I experiment with things and then he takes them and makes them right. But, uh, yeah, it's uh, it, it's more uh, it, it's more of a you know a passion project and something that I think is uh, actually has a great market opportunity in, here in the states um, in terms of providing something different than what's out there with with coffee shops and and restaurants. So, well, you, you've made me want to visit next time I'm in Winter Park. Please do. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah. Well, Steve, this has been a, fa a fascinating conversation, and we just can't thank you enough for your time. Uh, if people wanted to reach out to you or learn more about Accesso, where would you send them? I would send them to accesso.com. First of all, it's a great place to find out what all of our solutions are. Uh, you know, what the solutions are that we offer, and, and learn a bit more about the company as well. Uh, we're also publicly listed in in the UK. If anyone's interested in checking out our stock, it's listed under ACSO on. Uh, in, in London on the uh, AIM exchange. So if you look it up, you can find that relatively easily or find it on our website. But you know, I would encourage you to follow our, follow our news. You can follow us on, on Twitter as well. Um, we, have, uh, we, we do post some relevant industry updates there and we're doing more and more with that in terms of social, social engagement. Um, and of course you can always you know, track me down uh, from the website as well. Excellent. Uh, well, Steve, as we wrap this up here, I, you know, we have one final question for you. And, you know, a lot of things that we talked about, you know, throughout this interview is, uh, you know, emerging technology and these trends throughout the industry and just making the overall experience better. And, you know, it requires, you know, so much forethought and so much innovation uh, from that. And, uh, you know, we want to know, you know, when you, you know, if we think, you know, decades into the future and you're looking back, what do you want your legacy to be in the industry? Well, that's a, that's one I did. You didn't, uh, you know, sort of prepare me for what's my <laughs> legacy, you know, <laughs> yeah, hopefully, hopefully that, um, I encourage, you know, I, I encouraged our team and perhaps the industry to the extent I have that influence to just think differently about their business. And, you know, this business is, you know, look at what's happening in the retail business. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's very challenged. Shopping malls are very challenged. And, you know, I don't ever want to see the theme park industry or the leisure industry end up in that same boat. And so how do you, how do you make sure that you're adapting to the changing trends and the changing customer expectations and how can technology be part of that? And, you know, hopefully people will look back and say, well, you know, Accessor really helped us, um, you know, keep pace with what was happening around us and, and look what happened to those around us that weren't using that technology. Um, and hopefully we've made a difference um, for for operators that are not of the scale you might, you know, be Disney or others that have, you know, lots and lots of resources to invest. But, you know, other companies, big and small, that could that could take advantage of something from a service provider um, that we can offer, whether it's queuing or, or you know, state of the art ticketing or whatever that whatever that service is. I hope we can look back and say we made a difference in the industry and we helped keep it relevant and successful. And uh, you know, in the near term, I hope we can say that um, on the other side of on the other side of what we're experiencing now with the shutdown, that we've made a difference in helping the industry get back on its feet. Awesome, thank you for that. Uh, really appreciate it. We we really appreciate your time today. This uh, you know was a, a fantastic conversation. Uh, you know, Matt, and I really enjoyed getting the the opportunity to chat with you. So thank you so much for uh, for joining us here on the podcast. And uh, for everyone out there listening, uh, just remember, we are all attraction bros. Thanks for joining us for another great episode of the Attraction Pros Podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's episode and we'd love to hear your feedback. Feel free to drop us a line on Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn and make sure to follow us on all the social channels. And make sure you've subscribed to the show so you can get the latest episodes every single week. Also, if you're new to the show, be sure to check out all the great episodes and guests we've featured in the past. 
And if you want to learn more about Matt and Josh and check out the best articles for you to operate your attraction most successfully, be sure to visit us at attractionpros.com.